Now speaking, Maria Lee, Vice President, Investor Relations. Good morning everyone and thank you for joining us for our second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. Joining me today are Jim Teichlet, our Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, and Jay Malave, our Chief Financial Officer. We have posted charts on our website today that we plan to address during the call to supplement our comments. These charts also include information regarding non-GAAP measures that may be used in today's call. Please access our website at www.lockheedmartin.com and click on the Investor Relations link to view and follow the charts. We would like to remind everyone that statements made in today's call that are not historical facts are considered forward-looking statements and are made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of federal securities law. Actual results may differ materially from those projected in the forward-looking statements. Please see today's press release and our SEC filings for a description of some of the factors that may cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements. With, now speaking, Jim Teichlid, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer. Good morning everyone, thank you for joining us on our second quarter 2023 earnings call. Our Q2 financial results were strong, with sales of $16.7 billion, up 8% year-over-year, and double-digit growth at both aeronautics and space. Backlog reached a record level of $158 billion, resulting from a book to bill of $1.7 in the quarter. We delivered 50 F-35s in the first half of 2023, all of which were delivered in the Technology Refresh 2 or TR-2 configuration. We expect to deliver 100 to 120 F-35 aircraft in 2023, with no change to our longer-term delivery outlook of 156 aircraft in 2025. We are raising and narrowing our full-year 2023 financial outlook, with sales expectations of between $66.25 billion to $66.75 billion and EPS expectations of between $27 to $27.20 per share. We are encouraged by the strong support for our program so far, and we look forward to the completion of committee reviews and the full appropriations process. We continue to see strengthening customer demand for the F-35, both domestically and internationally, with the Czech Republic expressing interest in Israel formally deciding to add 25 more F-35s. We are continuing the long tradition of leading the development of the next generation of military aviation, in this time, with both piloted and unpiloted aircraft at our Skunk Works operation. Sikorsky celebrated its 100th anniversary in June, and we achieved several milestones in the quarter in support of NATO allies. We entered into an agreement with Rheinmetall Defense to collaborate on a unique rocket artillery system to be produced in Germany, and we are continuing our partnership with Poland and Australia. We also successfully demonstrated digital command and control to synchronize joint all-domain operations during the Northern Edge exercise near Alaska, and we demonstrated the first use of artificial intelligence capabilities on a stalker unmanned aircraft system for recognition and tracking of ships at sea. We recently announced a collaboration with Global Foundries to advance U.S. semiconductor manufacturing and strengthen resiliency within America's supply chain. Jay will now discuss our quarterly financial results and full-year 2023 outlook. Now speaking, Jay Malave, Chief Financial Officer. In the second quarter of 2023, our consolidated sales increased 8% year-over-year, driven by double-digit growth in aeronautics and space. Segment operating profit was up 5%, and earnings per share on an adjusted basis was up 6.5%. We generated $771 million of free cash flow in the quarter, with nearly $330 million of capital expenditures. We returned almost $2.8 billion, or 137% of free cash flow, to shareholders through dividends and share repurchases. Aeronautics saw higher volume on the F-35, C-130, and classified programs, resulting in a 17% increase in operating profit. Missiles and fire control saw higher sales volume on tactical strike missile programs, but lower volume within integrated air and missile defense, resulting in lower segment operating profit and margins. Rotary and mission systems saw lower volume on Black Hawk, partially offset by favorable volume across several radar programs, resulting in slightly lower operating profit. Space saw continued development activity on the next-gen interceptor and classified programs, with additional upside coming from Orion, resulting in a 15% increase in operating profit. For the full year, we've increased our sales, segment operating profit, and earnings per share outlook while also tightening the ranges based on our strong year-to-date performance. We expect minimal impact to our cost throughput in 2023 as a result of the lower F-35 aircraft deliveries. We remain committed to $4 billion of share repurchases, with $2.7 billion in the back half of the year, and expect to return more than 100% of our free cash flow to shareholders for the year. Melius Research Analyst Rob Spingarn inquired, Jim and Jay, could you provide more detail on how the strong backlog expansion at MFC will drive performance in 24 and beyond? Will it be sustainable? Additionally, can rising volumes on legacy programs help mitigate margin pressure from classified work at MFC? 
Jay Malave replied, In January, I said to expect low single-digit growth for 2024. We have a strong backlog of demand, but we need to analyze the supply chain performance to determine if our growth outlook will change. We are confident that we will return to growth, but the margin profile at MFC will likely remain under pressure for the next few years. The upside from higher margin products may provide some mitigation, but we won't know until we understand the contribution and timing of each program. Jim Teichlet replied, Rob, I can provide some long-term context here. The U.S. government has multi-year procurement authority for Lockheed Martin products such as Joint Air to Ground Missile, HIMARS, ADICMS, GMLRS, PAC-3 MSE, Javelin, Wurazim and JASP. We are currently pursuing multi-year contracts for GMLRS, PAC-3, Wurazim and JASP. The DOD has allocated $62 billion in four bills for Ukraine support, of which $44 billion is for restocking U.S. munitions. We estimate that $7 billion of these funds could be allocated to Lockheed Martin programs. This presents significant long-term upside opportunities for our MFC business, which are high margin and have increasing international demand. Wells Fargo Securities Analyst Matt Akers inquired, Can you provide an update on Tech Refresh 3 and its cash impact? How were you able to offset the cost and maintain this year's guidance? Is it fair to assume additional deliveries above the 150 level for 2024 and a cash benefit associated with that next year? Jay Malave replied, the impact of the delayed aircraft deliveries on our financials is approximately $7 million per aircraft. At the beginning of the year, we expected to deliver 147 to 153 aircraft. At the midpoint of 150, that would be a $210 million impact, and at 100 aircraft, it would be $350 million. We are working hard to manage and offset this with other opportunities in our portfolio. If any of these aircraft slip into next year, we will recover the remaining payments upon acceptance of the aircraft in 2024. Jim Teichlet replied, We are applying all the necessary resources to ensure that we deliver more than 156 aircraft in 2024. We are running extra shifts and deploying subject matter experts to our suppliers' operations to keep this on track. Flight test programs are on schedule and we have sufficient pilots for acceptance. The flight test program is designed to narrow the funnel of testing for all aircraft functions and mission capabilities in a methodical way. We estimate that it will be completed by the end of the fourth quarter this year, though it could move into early 2024. We are doing everything we can to ensure that we have the option for December delivery. Robert W. Baird and company analyst Peter Armand inquired, what investments are necessary to support the backlog growth and CapEx profile? Jay Malave replied, we expect CapEx to remain elevated in the back half of the year, with our forecast of $1.9 billion to $1.95 billion for the year. We're also looking to reduce working capital to levels we've seen in 2020, 2021 and 2022, and make it a source of cash in spite of growth. Jeffrey's analyst Sheila Kahiaglu inquired, what drove the improved outlook for the $700 million in higher revenues related to space development? Was it competitive wins or something else? Jay Malave replied, we've seen an earlier than anticipated ramp in some of our programs, particularly in our national security space and strategic and missile defense businesses. This includes classified programs, protected communications, NGI, and next-gen geo slash appear. This has resulted in higher performance than expected in the first half of the year, with a bit more to come in the second half. Seaport Research Partners Analyst Rich Safran inquired, could you please clarify your remarks on the F-35 engine upgrade and discuss what this means for Lockheed and the F-35 program? Jim Teichlet replied, Rich, you're spot on. As Lockheed Martin, our role is to receive engine performance data from manufacturers and translate it into aircraft performance data for our U.S. government customers. We provide this information to help them make decisions, but we don't have a formal company position on engine selection or modernization. We simply implement the U.S. government's decision. Goldman Sachs analyst Noah Papanak inquired, Jay, what progress have you seen in closing the gap between outlays and authorization in the second quarter? Are supply chain issues resolved and is your guidance based on the assumption that the gap will continue to close? Jay Malave replied, I expect outlays to increase in the back half of the year. We anticipate $1 billion more in sales compared to the first half, largely driven by aeronautics. The year-over-year -year comparison is more level-loaded than last year due to a $325 million shift from the second quarter to the third quarter and a light award on the F-35 program that was expected in the first quarter but converted to sales immediately. This means we won't see the 7% growth we saw in the fourth quarter of last year, but we are still on track to deliver growth earlier than expected. Goldman Sachs analyst Noel Papanak inquired, Jay, could you provide us with the latest figures for pension contributions and cash recovery beyond 2023? Jay Malave replied, we anticipate a cash contribution of between $500 million and $1 billion in 2025. 
Our goal is to offset this through increased net income, reduced R&D capitalization headwinds, and improved working capital performance. We aim to deliver low single-digit free cash flow growth on an absolute basis, and mid-single-digit free cash flow per share growth with our share repurchase program. Wolf Research Analyst Miles Walton inquired, Can you discuss the potential for increased F-35 production above 156 per year with Rheinmetall's fuselage production beginning in 2025? Jim Teichlet replied, Miles, the demand for our aircraft continues to be strong and we are working with our suppliers and the U.S. government to increase production beyond the current 156 level. The Rheinmetall Center fuselage expansion will be beneficial in helping us reach that goal. Wolf Research Analyst Miles Walton inquired, Have you slowed production on the F-35 due to the TR-3 issue? Jim Teichlet replied, We have not yet begun ramping up production. We are tracking through the supply chain as if we were preparing to increase production from 100 to 140 and ultimately to 156 aircraft. The deliveries will be delayed until the software load for TR-3 passes all flight test points. This requires integration testing in the air with multiple aircraft flying together. This is what will cause the delivery delay, not a production lag. RBC Capital Markets Analyst Ken Herbert inquired, Can you provide insight into how much of the backlog growth is related to Ukraine and any potential risks associated with the war or funding? Additionally, how should we think about the potential margin impact from longer-term agreements? Jay Malave replied, Our backlog for the second quarter included 20 contracting requirements, with some GMLRS requirements as well. We are working towards multi-year contracts, but have not yet entered into any agreements. The backlog is highly likely to convert to sales, and we are continuing to have dialogue with the customer to draw up multi-year requirements. As far as margins, we will enter into agreements with our supply chain over the same period of time as our customer, so any benefits we get from that will be passed on to our customer in terms of favorable terms and pricing. We don't expect any margin upside from where we are today, so margins should remain consistent. City Analyst Jason Gursky inquired, J. Jim, could you provide us with an overview of your expectations for the other segments in 24 and beyond, as well as any updates on the 1LMX initiative and its impact on margins? J. Malave replied, in terms of growth in 24 and beyond, we expect total consolidated sales to be in the low single digits. MFC should be significantly higher than that, as it will be our highest growth segment. We anticipate the other segments to see some growth, but MFC will be the main driver. 1LMX is a major initiative for us, encompassing ERP, engineering, manufacturing execution, customer relationship management, HR systems, and more. It's intended to make us more competitive and the benefits will be passed through to customers in pricing. We don't expect to see a direct margin benefit, but it will help us capture more business and maintain our leadership. City analyst Jason Gursky inquired, can you provide more insight into the expected mix of development work and fixed price going forward and how it will impact margins? Jay Malave replied, I can confirm that the mix of products will be a factor in future margins. Barclays analyst David Strauss inquired, have there been any changes to your position on Section 174 based on feedback from tax authorities? What is your view on the potential acquisition of Aerojet by Lockheed or L3, and have they been able to satisfy your concerns? Jay Malave replied, in regards to Section 174, the IRS has acknowledged that this is an issue they need to provide guidance on. We're hopeful for guidance by the end of the year. Our position has not changed and we remain confident in it. There is proposed legislation to defer implementation of Section 174 to 2026, retroactive to 2022, which we are optimistic about and supportive of. We'll monitor the progress of the legislation as it works through Congress. Jim Teichlet replied, Aerojet Rocketdyne is a critical supplier of propulsion to the aerospace and defense industry. We need to ensure that it remains a merchant supplier, treating all prime contractors equally. Additionally, we need to ensure that resources are applied to AJRD's operations to improve its performance in terms of on-time deliveries, quality, etc. We have not yet received any commitments from Laharis that they will keep AJRD as a merchant supplier, which is what we are looking for. Bank of America Merrill Lynch analyst Ron Epstein inquired, What is Lockheed Martin's outlook for classified aircraft programs in fiscal 24 and beyond? Jim Teichlet replied, Ron, our classified portfolio has seen significant growth. We've seen a 7% growth rate when we aggregate all of our classified programs. Our Skunk Works, Space Operations, RMS and MFC have the capability to work in advanced spaces. We're endeavoring to move into areas beyond known science to meet customer challenges. When it comes to aircraft, there are reconnaissance and surveillance missions, air superiority missions and all-purpose strike missions. We have a strength in unmanned surveillance ISR systems and F-35 for the strike mission. The classified programs are largely air superiority and ISR, with the bomber mission carried out by the B-21. Jay Malave replied, Our classified business is a key pillar of our growth projection, with an estimated $8 billion in revenue. 
we anticipate mid to high single digit growth in this area through 2027, second only to our programs of record, which have seen particularly strong growth in the MFC sector. Alembic Global Analyst Pete Skibitsky inquired, can you discuss any changes in labor availability and costs since last quarter? Has hiring become easier and have wage rates improved? Jay Malave replied, we've seen a marked improvement in labor availability over the past six months. We've closed our key skill gaps, which has enabled us to see incremental sales growth. We've also seen lower attrition and better hiring rates, which gives us confidence that this trend will continue. This is good news for the industry, especially our supply chain. Alliance Bernstein analyst Doug Harnd inquired, how do you view the opportunity in missiles and fire control for revenue and backlog, given the current situation in Ukraine and potential NATO involvement? Jim Teichlet replied, I believe the tragedy in Ukraine has revealed weaknesses in our national defense enterprise. This conflict has demonstrated that great power conflict is still a reality in the world today. NATO countries, such as Poland and Lithuania, are taking this seriously and expanding their defense budgets to prepare for the elevated risk they perceive in the future. The U.S. and its allies must demonstrate they have the stockpiles and industry to support a long-term conflict if necessary. We hope the conflict in Ukraine ends soon, but the demand for defense products will remain high for the foreseeable future. Jim Teichlet replied, Thank you all for joining us today. We are proud of the progress we have made in launching our 21st century security concept and strategy. We have established strong partnerships with tech companies, large and small, to help us accelerate the adoption of digital technologies like 5G, distributed cloud, and AI into national defense. We are also investing in defense production supply chains and international production and sustainment operations to ensure a resilient supply chain and deter future conflict. I want to thank all of our Lockheed Martin teammates for their hard work and dedication to strengthening our national security and increasing deterrence. Their efforts have resulted in strong financial and operational performance this quarter. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to speaking with you on our next call in October.